For many, the French Revolution is understood to have been a natural reaction and escalation of common discontent against a disaffected elite, the result of which led to an overthrowing of the old French regime to be replaced by one more republican in character. Somewhere along the line, a reign of terror occurs, purging aristocratic and counter-revolutionary elements, and eventually Napoleon takes power. A somewhat unjust simplification of an event which went as nobody at the time expected. Looking upon it with genuine scrutiny, we find a mess of a movement which left its leaders tearing at one another, not to mention the economic, social, and political turmoils of the time. At the beginning, a movement with the original aim of achieving a voice for the belittled Third Estate quickly began to take on a radical and violent character, fed by an aggressive pack mentality, and perhaps for the first time ever, an overwhelming sense of power. The Third Estate asserted its dominance over the Estates General, converting it into the National Assembly, which officially abolished the monarchy, eventually being succeeded by the National Convention and French Republic. Once the king was done away with, it seemed to many within the Third Estate that they'd been handed a blank check with which to make of the state whatever they pleased, and with that the moderate voices which called for mere reformations to the system were drowned out in an ocean of radical calls of a dozen different sounds. The convention, and by extent the Jacobins, a politically diverse club of Democrats and Republicans, had originally seen domination by the Girondin, not an actual faction or party per se, but a loose group which stood in opposition to the Jacobin Montagnard. The great divide between these two had been more of character than initial ideology, as originally most stood on the same positions. However, the Girondins were lukewarm when it came to action. They spoke loudly, but as their demands became reality and the outcome of the revolution became more apparent, they soon adopted a more moderate stance as opposed to the Montagnard, who remained ever fanatic. These divides would eventually lead the two to align with the Royalists and Revolutionary Sans Coulant respectively, the latter of which would proceed to surround the convention and arrest Girondin leadership, wiping the faction out, leaving the Montagnard on top, and leading the Jacobins to become increasingly more radical. With the National Convention came the establishment of the Committees for Public Safety and General Security, which operated against enemies of the state both domestic and abroad. The Committee of Public Safety would eventually be granted executive powers by the convention, in essence establishing a dictatorial order, which would see to the initiation of the Reign of Terror, primarily spearheaded by one of the committee's leading figures, Maximilien Robespierre. The Reign of Terror, both intentionally and not, would gradually eliminate rival revolutionaries and factions both inside and outside of Paris. Robespierre and a handful of other leaders would come to represent a series of additional factions within the Montagnard Jacobins, which too would develop heightened rivalries with one another, notably the Herbertists and Dantonists, which would also be purged by Robespierre. The Herbertists for their atheistic and anti-clerical beliefs, which Robespierre considered too extreme, while the Dantonists, the moderates within the Montagnard movement, came to be seen as overly indulgent and corrupt. Robespierre would utilize his now stranglehold upon the factions to intensify the reign of terror, as well as promote his vision for the future of France, complete with a new faith known as the Cult of the Supreme Being. What followed was a great lashback against Robespierre and the unbearable policies of the terror, in a series of events which would come to be known as the Thermidorian Reaction, which would reduce the Committee of Public Safety to its original powers, undo many of the recently established laws, and eventually see to both the arrest and execution of Robespierre. Soon enough the convention would be replaced by the Directory, but still this new governmental order came under attack from both the left and right, namely the Jacobins and Royalists. At this point, Napoleon had been making tremendous gains for France in Italy, but this did little to alleviate the great economic burdens and stressors brought about by the continued offensives of foreign powers. A new pro-monarchist order had come to rule the Directory, but would soon be overthrown by the Jacobins, something which Napoleon himself had a hand in, as he supplied a series of documents which implicated one of the Directory presidents with treason. This president had been one of France's most successful generals and a royalist counterpart to Napoleon himself one Jean-Charles Pichegru, who, funny enough, had briefly been Napoleon's math teacher. With him and the Royalists removed from power and barred from re-election, the Jacobins, or rather now Neo-Jacobins, would come to dominate politics once again, much to the concern of the moderate majority, who feared another reign of terror. With the nation desperate for peace and consistent order, Napoleon returned intent on taking absolute power for himself, and he would do so through the planning of another man, one Emmanuel Joseph C.A., the author of the Tennis Court Oath and the essential founding father of the revolution, who had quietly sat by the sidelines while his opponents fought one another. With the Directory now in total chaos, he saw this as his opportunity to seize total power and bring about the revolutionary changes he had originally envisioned. 
All he needed was a heroic military strongman to bring down the Directory with the support of the people, so that the rebuilding process could finally begin. Napoleon, however, had a different plan in mind, and would hijack CA's strategy to instead place himself in charge of the new French consulate, which, of course, he would then utilize to assume the role of French Emperor. But what if that changed? What if Napoleon fell in battle before this opportunity presented itself, or simply didn't succeed in his later plans? What if Jean-Charles Pichegru was never exiled and thus chosen by CA as the ideal hero general to spearhead his coup? Jean-Victor Moreau might also serve as an ideal candidate in a world where Napoleon fell in battle, but would otherwise be too loyal to him by this point. There are several ways to go about this with numerous potential claims to the seat of power. CA is the clear political mastermind to come to prominence in a world without Napoleon, but in that lies the problem of lacking a military commander of similar prestige, yet of lower ambition than Napoleon enough to step aside when his job was done. Jean-Charles, for example, would have been satisfied to see the monarchy restored under constitutional restrictions, but even before his exile he'd been disgraced by rumors of his involvement in royalist conspiracies, although this had not stopped him from being elected to serve as president of the Council of 500, albeit during a royalist resurgence in politics. In regard to the handful of options, it doesn't so much matter who CA decides to use, only that they play their role in the plot, then quietly step aside. We'll just assume for the sake of this video that among the potential candidates, one is just selected and carries out the plan without any hiccups, placing CA in the position of Grand Elector, a very powerful yet less dictatorial position than that which Napoleon had assumed in our world. CA had a vision of a representative semi-aristocratic republic, in which rights were protected by the state, and equality before the law was secure for all citizens. CA had varying opinions on monarchy, but seemed to favor the concept of a constitutional monarch, something both he and Napoleon considered valuable for the sake of maintaining a seemingly continuous hereditary order, even if the king himself held little authority, if only to prevent the rebellions and political instability which had defined the previous decade. CA would in essence possess an authority similar to that of a prime minister in Britain, with a separation of powers inspired by that in the US, seeing to the creation of a judicial, legislative, and executive branch, with him of course serving as chief executive. The Bourbon line would be restored with Louis XVIII taking the throne at significantly reduced power. And with that, French politics are brought roughly to where they were in the 1820s, with some notable exceptions of course. Because CA would be willing to compromise with foreign powers to restore Bourbon rule, a more favorable peace would be achievable in this world, seeing to it that France retains Belgium and German territories west of the Rhine River. CA's compromises turned much of the radical left against him, however this achieving of reform while restoring the monarchy would win him the admiration of most royalists and moderates. That being said, CA would still be in regular danger, as the radical left faction had proved itself to be the most volatile throughout the revolution, and may continue to act as an insurgency unless mass arrests were carried out by CA's regime. This period, as it had been during the later 1820s of our world, would see the emergence of ultra-royalist parties which advocated a return to absolute monarchism, and radical republicans which aimed for further liberal reforms. Increased tensions between liberals and conservatives over the years would no doubt still lead to minor uprisings and revolutions as in our world, which even still could shift the nature of the French government in one way or another. It's been said by some that the French Revolution hadn't truly ended until the mid-20th century, as the revolution had upset a centuries-old balance which now left opposing factions in constant competition, though near equally matched, taking the reins of the nation from each other in a repeating cycle. It's quite possible that with the early restoration of the monarchy, more effective attempts at compromise and the prevention of the Napoleonic imperial line, the balance of government in France, even if not perfectly restored, could achieve a more consistent and sustainable level of order. This France would still embody many of the liberal ideals which emerged in our world, but without Napoleon's conquest to spread them across Europe, they remain in large part confined to France, its colonies, and immediate neighbors. On that matter, because Spain is never invaded by France, the Spanish-American colonies don't react to fears of French domination and maintain a general status quo with the fatherland. It's often misunderstood how little support there initially was for independence from Spain as motivations laid closer to denying France authority within their realms, and of course in maintaining the limited autonomy that they held in the past. Newly independent Mexico had even offered the Spanish king the Mexican crown, however neither him nor his relatives accepted out of a refusal to acknowledge their independence, period. Only later was total separation embraced by the colonies as Spain's war with France left it economically crippled and politically unstable, ensuring them that even if they weren't better off alone, Spain was no longer capable of helping them. That would not be the case for this world, although we might still expect some regions to either demand more autonomy or initiate wars of independence. 
Even despite Spain being under fewer stressors in this world given the lack of conflict with France, we'd no doubt still see a buildup of animosity toward the inept King Charles IV, who often left his wife in charge of the state for long periods so that he could instead spend his time hunting. As a matter of fact, the lack of conflict with France might only serve to intensify focus upon the ineffective monarch, as there would now be nothing to distract from it. In the end, encouraging Charles' son to usurp the throne, similarly to what had occurred in our world. Ferdinand VII having planned a coup which he didn't carry out, but later encouraging his father to abdicate in the midst of several riots. The impact upon Spain is actually quite significant. The kingdom's proximity to France and of course Napoleon's invasion brought liberal ideals to greater prominence within the traditionally conservative state. Because in this world Spain remains more stable and France comes out of the bloody revolution only slightly reformed, the liberal movement in Spain has far less momentum behind it, preventing the revolts, crises, and civil wars which would have come about in the following decades, especially following Ferdinand's own passing. In our timeline, Ferdinand's reign was followed by a succession crisis when his brother, the heir apparent, was sidelined for Ferdinand's infant daughter, Isabella, and her mother serving as regent. Ferdinand's brother Carlos contested the claim, ultimately leading to the First Carlist War, in which the faction defending Isabella's claim was grossly comprised of Spanish liberals. If Ferdinand still decides to name Isabella his successor, Carlos would have little difficulty taking the throne by force. In regard to radical changes, the same would go for Portugal, whose royal family was forced to flee to Brazil during Napoleon's invasion, ultimately paving the way for a liberal revolution in the 1820s. Because Napoleon never invades, the royal family remains in Portugal, and Brazil never undergoes the changes that would have led to its independence. Our world had seen the royal family, out of necessity, open up Brazil to foreign trade, primarily with Britain, who saw tremendous opportunity for industrial and port development, something which would eventually lead to a population boom, a drastic change of economic focus, and a level of self-sufficiency which would drive a greater divide between it and its parent kingdom, not to mention steal away the heir to the Portuguese throne, who, having grown up in Brazil due to his family's exile, came to identify more strongly with the region, ultimately assuming the title of Brazilian Emperor. This time around, Pedro I of Brazil remains Pedro IV of Portugal, potentially being challenged by his far more conservative brother, Miguel I, should Pedro adopt liberal policies as had been the case in our world. The Holy Roman Empire, of course, is never dissolved by Napoleon and reorganized into the Confederation of the Rhine leaving Germanic Europe to remain continually contested by Austria and Prussia, who, without the spread of Napoleon's philosophy, don't undergo the social and political changes which would lead to the revolutions of 1848 and the rise of nationalism within Austria's diverse lands. The holy alliance which formed between Austria, Prussia, and Russia in our world to defend monarchism and Christian values from the secular liberalism of France would likely still form in response to the horrors produced by the revolution, this version of the alliance would almost certainly extend to Spain, parts of Italy, the Holy Roman Empire, and potentially Portugal if we assume Miguel takes power, possibly with the support of Carlos in Spain. Considering the French Revolutionary Wars and around 1799 to 1800 in this world, it is still possible for France to reobtain Louisiana from Spain through an exchange of occupied Parma. As military resources are now freed up, France may see a valuable opportunity to retake Haiti, utilizing Louisiana as a launching off point. If this succeeds, it could reinvigorate French colonialism in the Americas, at least on a small scale capable of exploiting sugar and other tropical crops. Should this expedition fail due to disease as it had in our world, France might opt to sell the territory to Britain instead of the US, given that the British could afford to pay more for it than the Americans might, and still held significant territory in North America. Regardless of the outcome, it's unlikely France would part with the land as cheaply as they had in our world, in essence forcing the US to either purchase it later down the line at a much higher price, conquer it, or leave it under foreign occupancy, confining it to its eastern coast. Depending on whether France or Britain occupies the region in the end, this could set the basis for a magnified version of the 1812 war, which, even if the US were to win by both defending its coasts and exploiting superiority in land battles, would still slow American progress and expanding west to the opposite coast. Because Spain is not crippled by political instability and the loss of its colonial wealth, it remains a capable maritime colonial power, as does Portugal and potentially France. They and the British Empire would thus continue to engage in occasional wars for claim to certain territories, most likely the Californian coast as a valuable port into the Pacific, the Caribbean contested by all major powers, the US included, the South American East Coast, which could be free game for any who take it, and eventually the continent of Africa. For the US, the basis of what would become the Monroe Doctrine still exists, and if anything, demands more immediate consideration by the government than ever. The rebound of Spain, Portugal, France, and Britain would make apparent the hazardous position the states were now in. 
virtually surrounded and denied access to valuable lands going grossly untouched by the empires. Unlike our world, which forced Europe to cooperate against Napoleon, knocked major players out of the game, and established a relative peace in the years following, the empires of this world emerged just as they have from prior recent conflicts. Borders might shift, governments undergo slight changes, but ultimately the game continues. And while the US may yet to stand on level footing with the empires, it can certainly count on their rivalries keeping them occupied until it does. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking and sharing the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.